Mission event with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and Special Presidential Envoy for Climate John Kerry. My name is Kate Calvin and I'm NASA's Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor. Before we begin, we'd like to show you a special message from the International Space Station. Greetings from the International Space Station. I'm NASA astronaut Jasmine Mugbelli. When I look down on Earth from 250 miles above, it's clear how interconnected we are. We orbit the Earth every 90 minutes and can see how our planet is changing from increased extreme weather to hurricanes to shrinking glaciers and ice cover. Through instruments on board the International Space Station and our fleet of Earth observing satellites, NASA and our partners are observing our planet and the effects of climate change and making our data free to the world. Our mission helped gather information about rising seas, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, global surface temperatures, the warming ocean, and plant and animal life in a way that you can only see from space. NASA installed EMIT on the outside of the International Space Station. Scientists have used EMIT to identify more than 50 methane super emitters, different infrastructure that emit methane at high rates. It's just one of the ways NASA is putting data into the hands of people around the world who are preparing and planning for our future. On behalf of our international crew, thank you to everyone at COP28 for your efforts to protect the beauty, wonder, and diversity of our home planet. And now I'd like to welcome to the stage NASA Administrator Bill Nelson and Special Presidential Envoy for Climate John Kerry. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Any space travelers out there? No. He's a space traveler. My, my guest, our guest here today, or my cohort here today, he and I served in the United States Senate together for quite a few years, and he represented uh, Florida back when Florida was sane. And uh, <laughs> get, get in trouble for that one, probably. Um, so, uh, and Bill went up, actually. He, he did make a space journey because he was on the committee that was sort of in charge of that, and they thought it was a good idea for him to know what he was talking about, which he did anyway. But Bill, share with me your, your reaction to what, in the context of the climate crisis, your reaction to emit and to Jasmine's message. And in the context that NASA really has become a climate agency, in addition to space and aeronautics agency, because of all those assets, those spacecraft that we have that are looking down on the Earth, gathering data of what's happening real time to our planet. One of them is uh, a mission called EMET, and it was to measure mineral dust. So when there are sandstorms, whenever the dust kicks up, it was to measure mineral dust. But lo and behold, we found out that it did something unintended. It was pointing us directly to a 100 foot by 100 foot area on the surface of where methane was being emitted. And so now we have a pinpoint location of methane emissions that we never knew about before. And that's just one example, John. The information, uh, most of the information that you get, is that just open source? Oh, available absolutely. Available to everybody, go to Everything your website. Everything we have is open, open transparent. Yeah. Absolutely. And we make it available on uh, nasa.gov on our website, and we put all of this real-time information up 
on what we call the Earth Information Center. And, and who do you, you must have a specific list of people that are designated receivers of the data you get. Well, we're even expanding it beyond the NASA website. We've organized something called Earth.gov, along with NOAA and NIST in the Commerce Department, and along uh, with uh, one, uh, the EPA, then we are all supplying this real-time data that anybody in the world just go to earth.gov and they can get this information. Fabulous. That's spectacular. So let me, um, what other uh, NASA activities are helping us in, in the climate fight? What, what are the other well, things you'd point to? Well, take, for example, we put up a, a mission called SWAT. It's for the first time that it measures the elevation of fresh water. We had measured the uh, elevation of the oceans before, but now we know the elevation of rivers, streams, lakes, reservoirs. We can tell all those hundreds of reservoirs in the western U.S. what the level of their reservoir is as they get into a drought. On a daily basis. On a daily basis. Or actually an hour and a half basis yeah. or something. Let, so, me, let me ask you, this is a Herculean task. How in the world are you getting the response from the nations as you try to get them to come along so that we can save our planet? Uh, I think it's a mixed reaction, to be honest with you, which uh, moments are very uplifting and some are depressing, to be candid. Um, I think it's safe to say that since the Ukraine war started, Russia hasn't done anything to try to improve things. And because of the war, there's a lot more emissions that are unleashed. Uh, it sets us back. But Russia was very difficult anyway. I mean, Russia is a huge, uh, huge extraction economy, almost the single thing they do. And I think you remember we used to joke in the Senate that Russia was principally a great big gas station. And... Uh, and, the, you know, it doesn't make a lot. Anybody here buy anything from Russia that you can think of offhand? Uh, it, there's just not a lot that gets made there. So we uh, are enlightened by efforts of a lot of countries around the world right now to try to transition much faster. There's too much of business as usual right now. I'm actually optimistic, even though I say to you, by the moments of... You know, sheer puzzlement uh, and deep frustration. Uh, for instance, we know that coal is the dirtiest fuel in the world. We know that people are dying, 50% more people die from coal input, what we call uh, PM 2.5, the measurement of particulates in the atmosphere. And coal, uh, we now know through a study by the University of Texas, George Mason, and Harvard Chan School of Health, that, that coal dust per se is responsible for double the number of people dying because of the quality of bad air. So there are just huge costs. In addition, uh, it's the biggest single ingredient responsible together with the sun and the heating for the heating of the planet. 90% of the heat of the planet. In other words, methane is responsible for 50% of the heating of the planet. And yet only 1% of the funding within the climate sphere has gone into dealing with methane until now. When I was privileged to lead our delegation to negotiate the Paris Agreement, we didn't talk about methane. I mean, shame on us, too. We didn't talk about methane. It wasn't the topic of, well, we got to deal with methane at this big cop. And, and so it wasn't until we went to Glasgow uh, and uh, President Biden put forward the methane pledge that every country was going to try to reduce their methane leakage or venting or flaring uh, on, by uh, 2030, uh, by 30 percent. And we just the other day, we had a big methane summit because China and the United States and the latest negotiation we had, China agreed 
to include all greenhouse gases in its NDC. It wasn't even including methane in there. So now that's one step forward, and all countries will do this. And secondly, we agreed, China agreed that uh, we would both work to rapidly deploy renewables in order to have a view of being able to reduce emissions during the 2020s, whereas China previously had been much later than the 2020s. So we're stepping forward. But, you know, uh, the IEA has told us that if we do everything we said we'd do, we promised in, in Glasgow, and if we do everything we said we'd do in, in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, we would hold the Earth's temperature increase to 1.8 degrees on Glasgow, 1.7 degrees on uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, which tells me and should tell you we can win the battle. Uh, it's just can. that we're not doing it. We're just not doing it. That's right. And uh, by the way, I want you to know that John is not a Johnny-come-lately to this issue. He was the principal person in the United States Senate that was going after climate change. So bless you for this continued public service. How are you doing with China? Um, well, we talk. I mean, uh, you know, you can't, you can't get much done with a country if you're not talking to them. And so we actually sit down, and Xia Zhenhua, who is the Chinese special envoy, uh, he and I have known each other for 25, 30 years. And uh, I appreciate your, your flattery that I was the only guy dealing with, the, with the, this issue in the Senate after Al Gore left to go to the vice presidency, because Al obviously did an enormous amount. Um, and a group of other senators did, and you, you know them all. Uh, but the, the, uh, the key now is that China has a lot of coal coming online. And Asia, writ large, has a lot of coal coming online. It's about 550 gigawatts of coal. And the key is going to be for us to be able to reduce that number somehow. And we're going to work at it very, very much. But tell me something with respect to um, uh, this, the, the NASA effort here and what you're, you're engaged in. Um, is there a way to even, uh, to a greater extent than is beginning to happen? I mean, a lot of people probably weren't aware of what you just said, that you can pinpoint the, the CO2. You can pinpoint CO2. You can pinpoint methane. Now, methane, folks is 80 to 100 times more destructive than other greenhouse gases in the early years. And in the, in, the, in, the, in the later years, it's 20 times still more destructive. So it's imperative we get the methane and bring it down. And we now have a challenge of something called fugitive gas, which with the melting and thawing of the permafrost, this stuff just where it comes up. And it places in the ocean in the north where you can just light a match on the ocean that goes on light on fire. So we got a real challenge to capture this stuff. Can you up the level to which NASA is uh, tracking and exposing? And particularly, for instance, the, I know that on the front page of the New York Times, I think this past year, there was a big purple glob in the middle of the paper as they pinpointed probably your picture of a methane, a super methane leak. And I wonder if we could do more, because a lot of companies, global companies now, their footprint is also traceable, correct? So this will be a situation where you can run, but you can't hide. And that's going to create an opportunity for broad public accountability in ways we haven't had. Talk to us a little bit about that. The short answer to your question is yes, we can offer a lot. The longer answer is that we are putting up four great observatories, the first of which is coming in a few months. Uh, with those four observatories and the 25 spacecraft and instruments up there on the space station that we have now, we will have a composite 3D picture of precisely what is happening to the Earth, including all the greenhouse gases. Updating it daily? On a, on a regular basis, all day. Every hour and a half wow. that a satellite revolves around the Earth. Yeah. That will be the update. And we're going to give you the information 
for the leadership of nations to understand that you've got to be able uh, to do something about this because this is the only home we have. Yeah. And, John, it's so beautiful, but it looks so fragile. Mm. Well, that's a great note to wrap up on, folks. Uh, uh, this must be old Senate day in, in, in uh, Dubai because I have to go over and do a thing with Hillary Clinton over at the other place. But um, really, that's an eloquent note on which to end. It is fragile. It is surely beautiful. Uh, that's one of the most famous, iconic pictures in the world. Uh, please keep the information coming, and let's figure out how you and I might work together to put more of it out in the public in more dramatic ways so we can move people perhaps even faster. Fair enough? Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary John Kerry. NASA Director Bill Nelson.